so I just wanted to um, go through some of the practical things that we do as part of the built environment. And it's really refreshing and um, good to know that all the previous talks have all been reinforcing what we're actually doing in practice. So as part of this um, presentation, I'm just gonna talk about um, what um, services we adopt to make the buildings a little bit more carbon efficient and move towards net zero. Now you've got to understand that we, we all the projects we do come from our clients. So the client gives us briefing, there's local policy constraints, there's local site constraints, where, and we work with all of these things to make sure that the end product that we deliver is far better than what would have been delivered previously or 10 years ago or you know 15 20 years ago so um we're just go i'm just going to um talk about how we actually um um implement the the design and in going forward so then we're, the way we tackle any building that we're designing is we look at the embodied carbon which is during the construction phase and then um, in use. And then we also look at the operational carbon. And this is how we have um, approach, um, which is all, all aligned with the UK Green Building Council. And then whatever is left also, if, for example, if we're trying to achieve net zero, we achieve, we implement whatever measures we implement, and then we achieve 68% to 70% uh, carbon reduction, and the balance then gets paid by an offset generally which is in line with the local policy count, um, policies. Um, so how do we go about uh, the embodied carbon? So when we look at the building materials, we look at um, the facade, we look at the services, we look at the structure, and all of that has what we call environmental product declaration, it's EPDs. And what that entails is the uh, the embodied carbon in making that product, in bringing it to site, in constructing it, and then the whole life assessment. So the, we focus on the A1 to A3 stages initially when we do the design to make sure that the product that we are designing has the least embodied carbon um, in the process of it being manufactured. And then as you move on to the construction stage and use and end of life, the assessments carry on. And the way these uh, assessments are done, it's an online software, and then it's got a database of lots of products. And these products are used to select the product that is what you are putting into the design. So say for example, I'm doing a ventilation system and I select a particular ductwork type I would put in the embodied carbon of that particular ductwork from a manufacturer. And then that would give me the embodied carbon of that ductwork for the entire building, identifying the length of how much and how big the ductwork is. So that's how we use the EPDs to try and uh, calculate the embodied carbon of the, of, of the services. We do the same thing for structural. And we do the same thing for facades in terms of glass and mullions and um, you know the brickwork and all of that. So this is uh, just a typical example of the EPD for windows. Now you can see there's a very different types of windows. So some windows have a higher carbon content, whereas some have lower carbon content. Now you've also got to remember that all this is also cost driven. Obviously, there's a QS on board who's constantly checking whatever we are designing is in line with the budget because obviously all the projects that um, the client brings us have a budget constraint. And that is when we fine tune all of this to strike a balance in whether um, we go for the least um, embodied carbon, but is probably a bit more expensive or you go for the cheapest one, but it's got a lot of embodied carbon or you go for a med medium one, depending on how, because there's lots of moving parameters that we need to have to balance. And that's how we work that out based on the constraints and, uh, and the cost, cost and the design constraints as well. So after that, what we do is we look at the operational energy. 
So that was the design and now is the operation. So when the building is actually designed, how do you uh, determine um, whether the design that you were asked to do is actually performing or not? Now, in terms of um, data, uh, Jennifer quite nicely put it that data is really key. And like we say, data is the new currency, but not in, 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 in a dodgy way. I think this is data about building services, understanding how your building is performing, whether it's consuming the right amount of energy. If it's not, why is it not? Because it was designed to consume only this much amount of energy. In practice, it's only it's consuming far greater. Why is that? So then we then work out how to do the set points and fine tune it. And that's when we come to design for performance, making sure that what we are designing is actually performing. And the interesting thing that's come recently from Australia is called um, Neighbors. And what that does is focuses us on designing for performance to look at systems which are having an implication on all the services that are building the building. And that is not only just services, but also the envelope, the structure and everything. So if you, it, it forces us to focus on the facade, whether your, your solid to glazing ratio is right, whether your orientation is right. If the building is oriented south, it has a lot of, um, you use a lot of energy to cool it and heat it in, in, in sorry, cool it in summer and then heating because it loses if it's glazed completely. So if it is 50-50 glaze, obviously nowadays glazing is kind of quite a fashion thing. There's a lot of glazing. Um, so we're trying to make sure that the balance struck between the glazing and, and the solid part is, is right as well. The other thing is windows, are they openable? Can we make them openable to make the most of the natural ventilation that um, is available? Can we du double glaze it, triple glaze it? Now, again, cost comes into that when you go for triple glazing, it's quite expensive than double glazing. Optimize the location. You don't need full height glazing in certain in instances. The, the, the window optimum daylight sunlight is in the middle where you can maximize the daylight coming in. So those are the kind of things that we kind of input early on into the design when the architects are do doing the massing modeling and the facade design. Structures, now cross laminated timber, glue lamb beams, they are the, they're kind of um, structural solutions which have quite low embodied carbon. Recycle aggregates, you know, try and recycle, uh, use recycle aggregates for your foundation. Those are the things that really bring down the embodied um, carbon down. Then in terms of MEP services, we look at the energy source quite you know, in, in depth, making sure because boilers and CHP and gas is kind of phasing out. We're now looking at more and more all electric solutions. We've looked at air source heat pumps. We've looked at ground source heat pumps. We've looked at exhaust air heat pumps and all of those with natural and mixed mode ventilation is is the key driver into reducing the energy use that we have within the buildings. I think the other thing is also reducing um, demand and trying to reduce the peak demand as well. You know, by changing um, the, the way we work, um, by having um, a flexi working and all of that comes into, into play as well. Making sure that the heating and cooling set points, and we can comfortably sit in a room with 20, 21 degrees, if that goes above by one or two degree, some people might complain, some might not, but then you're trying to maximize on that energy that you use by changing from one degree. So all of that will help in making sure that the building that we are designing is using less energy. Um, I think the other focus that councils do uh, insist on as well as um, what we have, is uh, renewable energy. Sorry. Um, so in, and then metering is the other one. Um, metering is um, really key for understanding the energy usage and um, making sure that the energy that we use is the right amount of energy that we've actually designed in and making sure that 
the landlord IT equipment and the tenant IT equipment and the appliances are all kind of A star rating or AA plus star rating. Now, a lot of these loads consume a lot of energy, like servers and things like that, which instead of having local servers, you can have cloud serving because that's more efficient, that's more um, uh, energy efficient because a lot of businesses would have cloud servers into one position where instead of having a decentralized service. So again, that all those kind of things make a huge impact on the on the energy demand of the of the building. And this is a typical example I've just taken as an office as a baseline. So where we have historically we would have fan coil units, a lot of glazing, we would have gas boilers and CHP with fan coils and steel frame. And this is what we would have designed a few years ago when energy uh, reduction wasn't so much of a focus. But now we look at uh, a new target, which is you know reduce the number of glazing, maybe use air source heat pumps, have demand control ventilation, you know, have lesser loads and make sure that you have cross laminated timber decking as a structural solution. But that's that is that still doesn't get us to the to the end line, which we're trying to push uh, further afield. And then you're tr also trying to use um, openable windows. That really helps. But sometimes there's a challenge with openable windows because the air quality becomes an issue, the noise becomes an issue. So you have to then look at the site con constraints, making sure that where the site is, is actually, you know, is feasible to have openable windows because if the air quality isn't great, unfortunately, you don't want to bring that air into the building. So then you have to weigh up the options to understand whether that, that really is the right solution at, for that particular site. Um, the low carbon tenant solution, again, I mentioned before, having a decentralized server and a centralized server is, is a centralized server is much better than having a decentralized server. So again, we help our clients make these decisions to help them reduce their energy footprint. Um, as previously, I mentioned about neighbors. Now, neighbors is not the, the TV serial neighbors, but it's a, a national Australian building energy um, uh, modeling service. Um, it's, it's been in Australia for 10 years, and they use this system to understand what um, building, what energy your building is actually using. And it also helps understand the, the building owners understand how well their building is performing, whether they need to fine tune some of the aspect of the controls, which we then go on to um, um, tweak to make sure that less energy is consumed. And that is from the data that we've collected over the year or two years or three years to make sure that the building is performing as it should be designed. And this is just uh, a few of the projects that we have um, from various sources um, collected over the period where you can see that the kilowatt hour per meter square uh, for the year is kind of you know, reducing um, based on uh, mixed mode ventilation or um, natural ventilation or a me totally mechanically uh, ventilated system. So all of these um, systems collectively help us reduce um, the carbon footprint or use less energy. But as I said before, it's, it's about understanding how the buildings are performing. Now, we are now more and more focused on understanding how the building is performing. So we actually go back and review the results of the controls, the energy monitoring system, and the end users as well to make sure that the building is actually performing the way they want it to be. So if some people are saying that it's always cold in the office. We investigate, we find out why is it always cold? Do we need to then change the set point? Make sure that the timing of the heating coming on is earlier rather than later. So instead of starting at say seven o'clock in the morning, we started at six. And then instead of finishing it at five o'clock in the evening, we start, we stop stop it at say four or 3.30 or something, because that will help us use the energy more efficiently. The other thing we also look at is the actual indoor quality of the building, making sure that the, the air quality of the indoor 
indoor air quality of the building is is okay the wellness of the of the staff making sure that um what their well-being whether they enjoy working in the office environment or in in the environment that they've been provided is it is it suit for, suitable for purpose and if it's not what what factors are influencing that so we look at all of the holistically and try and come up with uh, solutions which then we be able to tweak and get feedback and go it's like a cycle of feedback and making sure that it's implemented not only on that particular building but moving forward on the other buildings that we design and we carry forward and we take it on so as um as we as we go on to um be more and more conscious of of the design we also look at how we can offset the carbon so the other aspect of making sure that we achieve net zero so if we are achieving say 68 or 70 percent on site how do we actually offset the carbon so there are a lot of opportunities that we can advise on some councils will accept um, accept the offset payment some councils will say you have to achieve uh, invest in in green um, energy so you know on you know tur wind turbines pv farms trying to make sure that the offset is via a green initiative, which will then be, the money is then invested into making um, energy more greener or using more sustainable and um, uh, energy efficient resources. So I think in terms of us trying to um, make sure that all the um, uh, building services are in line and in tune with building because buildings do consume a huge amount of energy so we're trying to reduce more and more and the policies in place at the moment are definitely definitely helping because you have to comply to them but it would be good if we can make them more stricter and uh, you know more stringent and drive more towards trying to achieve net zero so thank you